At this time, we are going to join Columbia, South Carolina, Sarasota, Florida, and by the way, many, many more to come with this keynote address. Um, I'm not going to get into a long spiel about uh, who Greg is and what he does. You actually have up your, his bio right in front of you. Um, so you can read all about Greg, you can Google search and you can find all about, all about him. I'm just going to say this. This is the beginning of this group, guys. This is a nationwide group, Real Estate Investing Live. We are broadcasting this to other locations all throughout the country. We're going to continue to do that in other markets. And again, we're very excited. Let's actually give a hand to those in Sarasota and Columbia that are watching this right now. And also, everybody in this room, please stand up on your feet and welcome Mr. Greg Pino. This is uh, city number 19 in the last 30 days. And every time I wake up, you have that little picker. Every time I wake up, especially on the road in a hotel, I have to get really focused. I have to say, okay, I'm heading out. What are the time zones? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm catching a flight. I'm away from my family. Why am I doing this? I, I, I solved that a long time ago. I have um, I have two objectives. Two objectives. I can sit one on one and have a beer with you. It, it, or if I'm at the Javits Center with 10,000 people in New York City, I have two objectives. You're going to tell me at the end if I've met the objectives. Okay? Number one, to leave tonight, I want you to feel an inch or two taller. I want you to feel taller. I want you to be standing up a little straighter. I want to be uh, air in your lungs. The second objective is I want you to be off balance. I want you to be what I phrase wonderfully disturbed. My objective really revolves around change. And if we're not changing, we're dead. And so, how do you do that in an hour and a half? I don't know. I'm not a speaker. I'm not a teacher. I'm a pretty good carpenter. I want you to take out your phone, and I want you to put this number in. And put the name in, put the number in. You're going to have a job to do at the very end. So everybody has a phone these days. Uh, my kid can enter this in about four seconds. So I would just hand my phone to them and then they would do it. And then once you've got that entered in, put it on silent. My real estate career started when I was eight years old. I didn't know that it was starting when I was eight years old, but I'm telling you I can go back, and it was when I was eight that the basic formation of entrepreneurship took root. I have one brother, no sister. My one brother is almost two years older than I am, about 20 months. And, and, uh, and so I had a coming attractions to everything in my life, right? If he would go to kindergarten, I knew that two years from now I'd go to kindergarten, right? If, if he got a pair of jeans, two years later they'd be my jeans, right? <laughs> you know, it was that kind of thing, right? Well, when he was, Eight years old, he got to play baseball. And I got to go along with my dad 
had to take him to baseball, and I got to watch him play Little League Baseball. And it was so painful for me to watch. I wanted to play baseball so bad. And I was actually, at least in my mind, as good as my brother. Why do I have to be eight, said I. Well, you have to be eight. And so I waited and waited. I counted the days. And I showed up at my first practice, finally. I've got two batting gloves. Who needs two batting gloves? I have my mitt, my hat. I'm ready to go. We're going to hit balls, catch grounders, pitch, throw. It's baseball time, right? I showed up at my first practice, and the coach brought us all together and said, come on, boys, we're going to go sit down and talk. And he took us into the outfield. We sat in this great big semicircle. There was like 20 kids. And for an hour and a half, he lectured us on our responsibility as young ball players to help financially contribute to the needs of the league. I got a full on income and expense of the league. I knew the cost of lights, chalk, mowing, umpires, everything. I knew every dollar that the league cost. And now, in some way, it's my responsibility as an eight-year-old to help contribute. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to sell almond rope. And in order to be on the team, you have to sell two cases of almond rope. 24 cans of candy. That first night, we didn't throw a ball, catch a ball, hit a ball. But all of us went home with two cases of the almond rope. We had to sell it to be on the team. And I was very, very shy. I still am. And I went home, and my parents said, how was the first practice? And I just said, it was, it was, it was terrible. We didn't play any ball. We didn't do anything. And, and, and I have to go sell candy. I did not remember this chapter from my brother's book at all. I think it was brand new. And I was devastated. And, you know, they tried to cheer me up. And they said, listen, you know, put on your uniform, put on your hat, you know, look as cute as possible. Go up to the door and tell them the good cause. Tell them this is for kids and baseball. And, uh, you know, it's like taking medicine, right? As soon as you get it done, it's done, and then you can play ball. You can do it. Come on. And they had me on the ass, and, and uh, they had it out. And I'm like, oh, my God. I, I'm a shy kid. And, you know, sales. Are you kidding me? I skipped the first house instinctively. They were assholes, right? I, 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 just, I just could not make myself go to the front door. And so I went to the next door, and they were nice, older, retired people. They had a pool in their backyard. They would sometimes invite the neighborhood kids. And I said, start here. It was like an instinctive warm market. You know? <coughs> start where it seems like the coals are already burning a little. And I walked up to the door, and you know, stomach churning. And I, I walked up, and I knocked on the door, and adjusted my hat, looked as cute as humanly possible, right? And the door opened, and it's Mr. Peterson. And he says, hey, Greg. And I said, well, Mr. Peterson, I'm selling almond rope that to help support my baseball team. Would you like to buy a can? And there was silence. Then he took like this deep sigh. And then he looked at his watch. He says, Greg, I'd like you to come in for a few minutes and sit down with me. I think I can help you with your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I just, I remember it like it was yesterday. I just wanted to run. I wanted to run. I was mortified. Like, I don't want to do this, right? But, you know, he's an adult. He's like a grandfather kind of age. I thought, what am I? I and I followed him in, and he sat me down. And, and uh, poured me a soda. That was nice. And he said, now, Greg, when you came to the door, can you tell me again what your essential proposition was? I'm eight years old. What? I, 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 
I'm like, I don't even understand the question. And I must have looked that on my face. I don't remember saying it. I'm like, huh? He said, Greg, let me put it a different way. If I was going to do everything you wanted me to do, what would I do? You would buy a can of candy? And he says, exactly! Exactly! Are you hearing yourself? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I literally wanted to run. I just, I was so confused. He says, Greg, Greg, what if I wanted to buy six cans of candy? Did you allow that possibility to exist? God, I guess not. He goes, no. Rule one. He says, I know it's, it's kind of a heavy thought. But never set a ceiling on the possibility of what can happen. Whoa, what are we doing here? That's the heaviest thought I've ever thought of in my life. I didn't really know what he meant, but I went, okay. He says, okay, question number two. It's going to be an easier question, Greg. If your dad came with you to the door, he wouldn't have to say anything. If he just was right there, like behind you, would I be more likely to buy your candy or less likely? I said, uh, I think more likely. I, I mean, my dad is 6'4", you know, 230s, you know, tied in for the Washington Huskies for crying out loud. You know, yes sir is a good answer for my dad. I think more likely he goes, oh, you are sharp, young man. Absolutely right. Principle two, bring references. Okay. <laughs> he said, you know, the other pieces of the equation, Greg, you got right. You got to be bold. You got to ask for what you want. He says, now, we're going to do some business. And I'm going to send you out the door. He says, so I would like six cans of candy. And I went, okay, this meeting just got a lot better. <laughs> Perfect. I even remember doing the fractional math as they go, I am 25% done, right? And I gave him six cans, and, and he gave me six dollars. And I went, okay. And he said, okay, we've done business, right? Here's where it gets interesting. You've got to really pay attention, Greg. Right? I said, okay. Do you know who lives next door? Do you know the Smiths right next door to me? I said, yes. He says, okay. Well, I want you to go there next. I know you're going to go to all the houses, but we're going to do it the same way every time. You're going to go to the Smiths, and he'll answer the door. He says, so you address him. Look, you, you did all that right. He says, when he opens the door, you to say it just like this. He says, when he opens the door, say, hello, Mr. Smith. My name's Greg Pino. I'm giving people an opportunity to buy a home and grow to help support my baseball team. Mr. Peterson, your neighbor, he's asked me to come speak with you today. He's purchased six cans of this fine candy and has assured me that that's likely nothing compared to what you might <laughs> He's also asked that when we conclude our business here in a few minutes, that I run right back next door and tell him exactly how many cans you want. <laughs> Mr. Smith, how many all in room cans would you like to have, sir? This is great, you get it? You, you see how that works? Bring references, that would be me. A little accountability thrown in. See how that works? And you know what? At eight years old, I was like, I got it. I could see, at least I got how this would work. I thanked him. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I, I had my now 18 cans of candy, and I'm walking slowly to Mr. Smith's house. I'm rehearsing my lines. I'm extrapolating on the pearls of wisdom. And I walk up to the door. I adjust my hat. I, I'm, I'm feeling a little more empowered than the first door. And I knock on the door, and he opens the door. Hey, what's up? And I said, I said, hello, Mr. Smith. My name is Greg Finio. I'm giving people an opportunity to purchase almond broca 
help support my baseball team and, and, and children as a whole, sir. <laughs> Mr. Peterson, your neighbor, he's asked that I come and speak with you. He has bought six cans of this fine candy and assured me that that's laughable compared to what you might do. He's told me you're the most philanthropic man in the neighborhood. Building up, right? I, and I said, and he's also asked that when we conclude business, I run right back next door and tell him the good news. Mr. Smith, how many cans of candy would you like? For baseball, for the children, sir. <laughs> I thought the guy was going to die. He starts laughing so hard. <laughs> it was one of those laughs that tears were coming down his face. He was wheezing. I thought he was going to pass out. He was, he was truly out of control. And then he starts wheezing, Judy, Judy, get over here. You got to hear Judy. And, and He's yelling in the house, and this lady comes up. She's like, what's going on? She's like worried, you know? And he, and he goes, do it again, do it again. And I do it again. And he made me do it again. And, and anyway, the dust settled. Everybody settled down. He goes, okay, okay, okay. All right. So listen. Oh, my God. All right. We're going to do business. How much you can? I said, they're a dollar a can. Said, okay, give me 10 cans. And he, he says, now, first of all, you go tell that lame-ass Peterson that I bought 10 cans. But it doesn't stop there. Do you know the Kramers next door? You need to go do this shit on them, and you come back and tell me how many they did. You got it? I go, yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. The number two young baseball player in the league sold 37 cans. I sold over 700 cans, and I never left the neighborhood. <laughs> and I did so every year in my, in my little league career. And it, it changed my life in a way that, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I, I developed what I call a towel on the road. The towel of almond roca is an adult slide. It's an adult slide. Everywhere I go, I hear people putting a ceiling on possibility. As good as it's going to get, how things go, oh, not bad. Best as could be expected. Being bold, knowing what you want, is how you're going to get anything. What do you want? And ask for it. Asking a question or proposition which can be answered yes or no is how we get things done. Will you buy this case? Question or proposition, yes or no. A lot of questions in the world, only a few questions of proposition. Be bold, ask the question. Never set a ceiling on the Possibility of what can happen. And tie your wagon to something bigger and more important than you. Bring references. And your batting average goes up. Those are very simple concepts, but mind bending when we look at a world that only does, in my opinion, a fraction of what they're able and what could possibly do. The next challenge I had after baseball, I was raised by this very strong, quiet dad, an amazing mom, who had nothing, who had no examples. So they were doing it the best they could with no examples. Neither of my parents ever had a father they ever met. They had alcoholic mothers. They were doing everything the opposite of everything they learned, but they were doing it the best they could. And one of the rules in our house was that our job as parents was to get you out of here responsibly. The day you're an adult, you leave. When you look up in our family dictionary, under adult, it means the day you graduate from high school. Under adult also means you don't live here. 
you feed yourself, pay your own bills. If you want to go to college, and we hope you do, good luck with that program. That's what it meant. And that wasn't a bad thing. We knew it since we were kids. And I watched my brother, the night he graduated from high school, off and on, rose to be the CEO of one of our country's biggest airlines. Right? I knew the night I graduated, I had to leave. So that was my next challenge. And I took it very seriously. So in my, in my sophomore year, I started researching, where am I going to live? Right? Junior year, where am I going to live? Well, then when I got into senior year, now it's getting serious, right? And I am a complete wallflower introvert. I am shy. And so the whole live with people around was never an option for me. Fraternities and dorm rooms and all the God. Uh, and so I, I was looking at houses close to the University of Washington, which I hoped to be accepted and go. And, and so my whole senior year was about looking at rental property. And as it now came into, I'm graduating in June, and here we are in January, now it's really getting serious. I've got to find something, right? And I pull up to this rental house. This thing is an absolute dive. I couldn't believe anybody ran an ad for this thing. I pulled up to this rental house, it was reasonably close to the University of Washington, crummy little three bedroom, one bath house. And uh, the guy met me there. And I pulled up, and he's waiting there to get out and get in. And, and I'm, just from the outside, I'm going, oh my gosh, what a mess. But I said, well, are you going to give me a tour? He goes, no, nope, the door's unlocked. Give yourself a tour. And when I walked in the door, it still to this day is one of the worst houses I've ever it was a mess. And I walked through just going, oh my gosh. And it took me one minute. And I walked out. You had to be careful that you don't fall through the deck. The roof leaked. It was just a mess. And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, honestly, do you want to know what I think? I want to be real respectful. I've, I've, I've learned to be respectful. But are you asking an honest question? Oh, yeah, give it to me straight. I said, I can't believe you ran it. You're really thinking somebody's going to rent this? Well, well, well why not? I said, it's, it's a mess. It, it, the, the bathroom's giving in. The deck's giving in. The roof leaks. The windows are broken. It's, it's a mess. And don't get me wrong. I know how to do everything that this house needs. My dad has taught me how to do every bit of it. I could put on a new roof, build a deck, no problem. But if I were going to do all that, I would want to own it rather than rent it. That's what I said. And he goes, well, maybe you should buy it from me. And being kind of snarky and out of character, I went, well, maybe I should. Wow. <laughs> I'm 17 years old. Now I'm just being a smart ass, right? But then he asked back, he says, well, what do you have saved up? And I said, well, I have $1,000 saved. He goes, well, what is your resume? I really never had an official W-2 job, so I didn't you know how to answer it that way. But I went, well, I'm a pretty good student. I have to work hard at it. I'm, I'm a pretty good athlete. I have to work hard at it. And I'm kind of fishing in my mind. What else can I say, right? And I'm like, oh, hey, I am the state's youngest Eagle Scout. Trust me. Praise kind of being cheerful, thrifty, brave, and irreverent. And he went, hmm, okay. All right. And he took out a little bit of He said, I want $25,000. bucks. i will take your $1,000 down. You can owe me $24,000. He took out a little book out of his pocket and he said, Can you afford two oh six ten a month? I didn't know what the little book was. It was an amortization book, but I didn't know that at the time. 206 10 I said, well, I don't know. And he says, well, 
says, take this home. Are you 18 yet? I said, no, but in a couple months I will be. Take this home. Talk to your mom and dad. If you want to buy it, I'll sell it. Here's my entire advice ever in business from my dad. I took it home. I handed in the sheet. I said, hey, dad, I looked at this rental house today. This guy will actually sell this to me. No. I handed him the sheet. Okay. I said, what do you think? And he goes, he looked at it for like less than three seconds. I handed back, he goes, probably better than renting. And he walked away. And as he's walking away, I go, so should I do it? And he, and he didn't even look back at me. He just goes, probably better than renting. <laughs> and so I called the guy back and said, okay, um, what do we do next? And he did everything. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. I didn't know what escrow was, title insurance was. I didn't know anything. But he did it all. Walked me through it. I learned fast. First part of April, 1976, I owned a house. I told him I didn't want to have a payment at least until July or August because of all the work it needed. Right? I was going to have to put in a lot of work. And he said, fine. So he wrote in, no approval of interest for however many days, first payment due, 30 days thereof. No, I mean, I understand it now. I didn't understand it then, but it worked. And on the night I graduated from high school, I moved in to this house. And my two buddies from high school heard that I had this house. Hey, you got room? Yeah, sure. Don't ever remember any sort of formal agreement. But all of a sudden, I had a house. My first payment was due. First part of <coughs> July. I was sitting down at my desk in my bedroom slash laundry room slash everything room. About 10 by 10. My bunk was on top of the washroom dryer. And I was sitting down at my little desk writing out my first installment check, $206. And I was right about right there. And Jeff and Kelly popped their head in the door and said, hey, here's the rent. And they each threw a $100 bill on my desk, I said, oh, thanks. And that moment is a moment that every time I've told this story, which is thousands, I get goosebumps because my heart like almost stopped. In that second, I said, hey, thanks. I looked back down to what I was doing, and I was realizing that my entire house payment, except for $6 and a dime, they just made it. And I'm not joking, it sounds so obvious, but I stood up and I started pacing back and forth, and my heart was racing, and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It's like my world, my simple little B minus world exploded. The best way I can describe it is because you were that age once. Do you remember when you were 18? Do you remember that this is when I get to go out there and like do it? The world was your oyster. And you have these dreams and these goals and all these things you're going to do, right? But you don't know how the hell you're going to do it. Well, you're going to do it, right? Do you remember that time in your life? And it was if in that moment a limousine pulled up front of that little house and a guy opened the door and said, anywhere you want to go, just get in. All you got to do is buy a lot more of these and find a lot more Jeff and Kelly's to pay for. That was it. That was the formula with what I knew on that day. I'm a reader. I'm an introvert. I'm a processor. I'm a 
exact time, the same week that that happened, that $200 at the table, I had been disturbed by a piece of script that I had memorized and it was going through my head again and again and again and again. I've been so disturbed by it that I've got to take this sentence. This means something so important. I've got to figure this out. And all of a sudden, that took new life. The guy that wrote this piece of script had kind of had it. He had kind of become frustrated and he headed out of Dodge and he went and found some little cabin on a, on a lake or a pond just to get the hell out of Dodge. Have you ever wanted to get in the car and just drive? Just drive. You don't even know where they are. Just go. Because you got to think. you got to process. It's not going right. you got to recalibrate, rethink. That's what this guy that wrote this did. And when he took off, he explained himself by saying, I went to the woods because I wanted to live deliberately. I wanted to live deep. To suck out all the marrow of life. To put to rout all that was not life, not when I die, discover I have not lived. And those words were resonating in my head. And then the limousine pulled up, metaphorically, and I lived deliberately. Lived deliberately, and here's how you're going to have a deliberate, purposeful life. It's like the whole thing came together. Right then, right there, three months after I turned 18 years old. When you look at this slide, I'm going to tell you what you don't say. I'm going to tell you what you don't say. You don't say, oh, there I am. Upper left, inch down, inch to the right. That's definitely me. That red one there, that, you no, know, left of that one. Yeah, that one, that's me. You don't say that. No one says that. No one says that. Because we're not created to be that. That's us right there. 101. There's nobody like you. No one. I don't mean that just because it's you. There's no one like you either. Or you. There's no one like you. And then explain to me why do we live Costco lives? I didn't want to live that life. I wasn't going to live. I wasn't going to live an original life. There's only two motivators. And there's only two choices. We tend to think, I'm going to try to avoid risk, especially in our business. You hear about it all the time. Risk mitigation. Let's, let's, let's risk analysis this thing. And we tend to think that there's a right choice. And that and if we go the right way, we'll avoid risk. And so we don't do things. We don't do them because that's the smart thing to do to avoid risk. Right? You know what happens when you don't do things? You risk regret. Oh, wait, I'm trying to get out of risk. The question really is, are you more afraid of failure or are you more afraid of regret? Because there is no such thing as risk, risk avoidance. And yet most people live lives of quiet desperation, afraid to go take a chance on anything. What do you know? There's only two ways to motivate anybody with anything. You're either running to or running from something. I made a decision on that day that I'm going to run to everything I ever wanted to do. <coughs> I 
And somehow, intuitively, I knew I had a vehicle that if I understood it, it was going to get me there. That's a lot of years ago. I realize I've been doing this full time for four or three years now. But I set a course to go get this done. I became obsessed with buying houses. I would have changed my major at the university if I couldn't have been off campus by 11.30 because I had important things to do, meaning seller meetings. And I bought hundreds of houses. And I mean, I started the next day. I would run off campus, I'd have seller appointments, and I'd be on four or five rehabs all through college. Homework was the last thing I did, and if it suffered, it suffered. Right? And houses, of course, you know, it turned into bigger things. So, you know, there's a sampling of, I bought and built apartments, mixed use and commercial, all over. This, this, this has been a busy life. But more importantly, life was designed around everything I ever wanted to do. It's not about money, it's about moments. And some moments to create them take money, right? But, but my life, I try to explain my life to people, it would be impossible. There's nothing normal about my life. It's extraordinary in every way with people at the center, with impact at the center, moments everywhere. And I put these up there to just ask you, to ask the right questions. Is your life filled with moments that matter? Not bad for an 84 year old guy and two sons, right? Believe me, we were the ones panting and sucking gas, not him. I, I don't take for granted anything that, that I do on a regular basis in my life. But I'm telling you that the roots of every one of these great moments, the roots of all these incredible things that I do on a weekly basis, it came back to that crossroads, that decision, the things that, 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 that life is about come from our commitment to live a deliberate life. A deliberate life. Not an ordinary life. I believe that at the end of it all, the person that can produce more of these kinds of pictures than anyone else is the winner. The impact things that you do, things that you're involved with, the moments you have. Not when you die and discover you've not lived, right? You get the idea of an amazing life, an amazing family. I got really busy in those early years. Crazy busy. And, and those years were years that drew a lot of attention. There weren't many kids doing what I was doing. And so when I was in my early 20s, um, I was asked to teach at the University of Seattle, Pacific University, to be exact. The dean of the School of Business hauls me in and he says, Listen, um, I know you went to the University of Washington, but we like you here, and, and this is a Christian university, and we want you to teach a class in the School of Business on, on real estate entrepreneurship. I am not a teacher. I am not that. No, I, I'm a real estate guy. I'm much better ripping on a bathroom, right? So, and, and he kind of gave me motivation from the possibility that this might be. I said, I don't even know what to teach. And he said, Greg, just teach what you do. Teach what you know. This will actually help you, he told me. And I remember sitting down and making a list of like, well, what should I teach? And it, it was overwhelming. The 
Because when you, like Brian talked about earlier, when you take action with your knowledge, really all that does is set the table for you to know more about other things. You, know, you take more action, the table gets set again. And you, go, and you never quit learning. I've been at this 43 years, and I, I read every single day things that I didn't know yesterday. And I'm enrolled in classes and study, and, 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 and that's what we have to do. But it seemed overwhelming to teach. But I said, all right, I created an outline. You know, it's a three-credit class. Here's how much time I have. Let's cover as much as you can. And, and, and you know what? It was, it was awesome. My first quarter, I had 40 kids. My second quarter, I had 480 in my class. It was around three times the size. I don't know why. I took every paycheck, so I went right back to the university, because that way they couldn't tell me what to do. I didn't want a job, and I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it my way. And my way was a little enthusiastic. I had kids standing on desks, and I'd say, the pillars, class, the pillars. they sit on the desk, captain, turns, location, expandability. And I'd go, good, sit down. It would be that kind of energy, because I was young, and they were younger. And I can tell you in Seattle right now, Troy Bolliot owns more real estate than anybody. One of my 18-year-olds in that class. Jay Young has the largest real estate company in Seattle, RPA. He was another kid in that class. Peter Larson owns Paragon Real Estate, largest commercial operation in Seattle. He was a kid in that class. You know why they came so damn good? They didn't know what they couldn't do. And they chose not being motivated by fear, but being motivated by passion. And I expected those kinds of results out of every kid in the class. Why not? If I can do it, you can do it. And I was committed to that thought. I was committed to that concept. We had class quarter projects of buying a house. Stop, theoretically. Damn it, do it. Let's do it. I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. And I started giving out these. And I didn't like it. How did you not get this done? How did you not get this done? And over the years, it became wonderful for those who were successful and so frustrating to me with those who didn't. And all of a sudden, I found myself becoming a student of the success equation. The success equation. It occurred to me, by being a professor at the university, the success way more than just being intellectually knowledge. But boy, I'll tell you, I pounded down some, some concepts that I sure believe in today. We're going to finance, that, that finance is the epicenter, that, that real estate is just the clothing that finance wears. We're going to get so good at the creation of notes. We're going to get so good at the negotiation of interest rate. We're going to get so into the minutia of finance, first right of refusal clause, maker of notice, first right of refusal, the purchase note, should beneficiary like to sell on prior to maturity. Every one of my students, I guarantee I could have called on Wayne right there, I could have called on Waylon right there, and they, because they are committed students of mine, would have stand up and they would have been, Mark, where's Mark? You would have nailed that. I, I would kill you if you didn't, right? Because they're students of the intellectual game. But what I learned is that doesn't, in and of itself, ensure success. We were talking about real estate in ways that most people didn't, don't even think about. The finance, the creation of notes, all of the moving parts within a really well-structured agreement. The collateral agreements, substitution of security costs, maker, maker's options, and substitute the collateral for the note, do a different piece of real property under the following terms and conditions. One, the substitute collateral has equity equal to or greater than the outstanding principal balance on the note at the time of substitution. On and on and on, right? How well do you know this stuff? Can you do it in your sleep with a shepherd on your lap to heat up too much and a ball game on? Because that's the arena you will be playing in. You don't sit in some conference room with a laptop. We're in a 
in somebody's crowded dining room moving crap off the table with distractions everywhere. How well do you know what you know? I'm not taking away from how critical, how critical the minutia of the toolbox is. I've put over 500 hours on CDs with the minutia of deal structure. I truly can tell you I've forgotten more than most people know. It's like they're doing it or it's their passion forever, right? Deals like this, right? It's like a simple deal, doesn't it? A little six unit deal, right? Perfectly located because I wouldn't buy it if it wasn't perfectly located. It starts there. Right? High demand. This is this this is the pin on a map, the most highest demand location in all of us yet. Right? How do I keep buying properties in the best locations that are never on the market? Well, there's a study all by itself, right? And here's the steal. Look at the price. Okay, it seems high maybe for Birmingham, right? Not high for Seattle, right? And you look at the terms, you know, 1150 with 50 down. Percentage-wise, what is that? Like hardly anything, right? Anybody allow you to buy their property with attorney review, financial condo review for less than 5% down? Very simple. Capital gains issues, right? Basis at zero. Why do they want to get a bunch of principal and pay tax on it? They don't. They don't. <coughs> the deal was structured with a lot of thought in mind with all the professionals of this industry chipping in. Right? So, but then you've got a note, right? A, a million one note. Great interest rate, but is it a fair interest rate? Of course it's a fair interest rate. How much is Bank of America giving you on CD right now? <coughs> oh, it's more than that? Well, then it's fair, right? Because there's billions of dollars in Bank of America, Wachovia, Wells, Chase, CDs at 2%. Do you see how the mind has to think differently because people say, oh wow, nobody would ever be involved in financing with a three and a half percent. No, really. Well, if you think that, it'll never happen. Coming attractions is what we're going to talk about next. But in this deal, you look at this and you go, okay. Now add a few things to this deal and it changes its life completely. If I said that that promissory note is collateralized by a deed of trust, on the subject property, which it initially was, <coughs> you'd expect that, right? But when I add a substitution of security clause and an exchange of note clause to this deal, the face of this deal changes completely. Substitution of security clause allows me to re-collateralize the note. The note is currently collateralized by this building. But if I wanted to, I could take the note, release the lien on this building, and put a lien on another building. It's one thing I could do. Now, the other building would have to have a million one of equity and enough cash flow to support the debt, right? OK. But stay with me. What if I could take the note for a million one and break it down into smaller notes, right? If I, came, if I came to you, young man, and said, hey, I've got a $100 bill. Do you have change for 100 And you went to your wallet. Let's say you did. What might you give me? 520s. I go, hey, thanks. Thanks so much. And I take your 520s, and I give you the 100 Are we all good? Anybody better or worse? That's what an exchange of note clause is. The ability to take a million one note and slice it up into smaller notes all whose total equal the mothership, whose terms are exactly mirroring the terms of the mothership, whose due dates, whose clauses all mirror the mothership. But instead of having one note for a million one, I've got 11 notes for 100,000, or something along that line. Now, let's just say I put those two together. And let's say I take this six-unit building that is perfectly located, 1,800 square foot units, 
two-bedroom, two-bath units in the most perfect location in Seattle. And let's say I take this building and I slice it up into six legal descriptions. I take it from an apartment building and I put it into six separate units, condominium units. Now I have six separate legal descriptions, right? Now that I have six separate legal descriptions, I could take that million one note and divide it into six separate notes, couldn't I? All whose interest rate follows the mothership note. And then, in the right market, entrepreneurship and climate, I may want, I may want to sell that unit to the tenant. And if I can show the tenant that they're actually going to be paying a net less amount to own versus paying me to rent, do you think they might say yes? So let's take that million one note, let's divide it up into six notes, 183 and change, right? All carrying the same interest rate and everything. Right? Same interest rate. So, so my payment now per unit is 534 per unit. That's my, that's my payment. But now I'm going to sell that unit for $320,000. i am not cashing out the underlying that's on that unit. I'm going to sell it on an all-inclusive trustee. I'm going to set the interest rate at 6.99%, call it 7. Right? And I'm going to create an income stream on a note. They're going to pay 320. They're going to put 5% down. I'm now the beneficiary of a note for 304,000. Right? My obligation is to a note for 183 and change. <coughs> My interest that I've set for them is at seven. My cost of funds is at three and a half. Now I can give you the trick question. What's my margin? And you might blurt out three and a half, the difference between three and a half and seven, but that's the wrong answer. It's only three and a half on the first 183 and change, right? Uh, on, on, on the remaining amount, it's seven. So the blended interest rate is, is more like five and a half. That's my margin. All said and done, if I sell this to the tenants, I've got an 89 thousand dollar annual income coming in out of this property that I don't even own, right? I've got three quarters of a million dollars of, of spread of equity between what I owe and what they owe me. And of course, if they want to cash me out early on that note, I have to let them. Can I charge prepayment penalties? Sure. Can I, can I act like a bank? Sure, I can. Right? But if they cash me out early, am I going to cash out my underlying? No, I'm going to substitute the collateral with something else. Right? Never cash out your cost of funds. Do you realize that when I go out buying real estate, I'm not buying real estate. I'm buying long-term low-interest debt where I negotiate the terms. Does that make sense? That's it. You want to make a lot of money right now? Go into a lot of debt, fixed rate, long-term money, 4% or under, with no due on sale. There you go. And in two years, when rates are at six and a half, there you go. You can actually sell a property for less than you paid for it and make a lot of money over time. How do I buy a house for two hundred thousand? Sell the exact same house for two hundred thousand and make a hundred thousand. That's not magic. That's finance. We have to understand that we're in the finance business. Chrysler is in the car business. The rubber, the steel, the paint, the leather. No. All that is is an excuse to be in the finance business. They make their money in finance. Okay. This is an example of a deal that would have been in my class from day one. Because this is what I've done hundreds of times in my life. Now, to understand that and leave here to be able to do that, boy, you're going to go to school. Everybody wants to fly. Everybody wants to fly. But if you said, oh, man, I've always wanted to fly, and I said, really? Come on, we're going to have a meeting at my office. And you don't really know what it's about. You come to my office, 
And, and you, you show up at the office, you go, wow, this is a weird place for an office. I said, yeah, it's kind of different, isn't it? And then you walk out of the first store, and you walk, oh, crap, there's a great big airplane there. And I go, yeah, you know why you've been here? Because I heard you wanted to fly. So here's the keys. Here you go. Let me hit the hangar door. Fire that baby up, go fly! Go! You're lucky day. Everything in you may want to start that. Let everything in you would tell you, don't start this and try because you'll kill yourself. Unless you've been to grand school. Unless you know, unless you know how to fly. Right? Well, <coughs> this toolbox that I would take to the university to teach these kids, some, everybody got the toolbox. Because that's what that class was about. Like, did everybody get results? No. And that's what frustrated that hell about. And I'm a young kid, and I'm fired up, like, listen, if I can do this, you can do this. Grab my belt, we're going to do it together. You know, I get all fired up, right? But it became a study for me of why, with great knowledge, doesn't everybody get the same net result? The study of the full success equation. Here's what I came up with. That, that, that there's more to this. And I realized early on there's more to it. There's nothing more common than bookshelves and garages and closets full of educational material that have done nothing. Is it the education's fault? You see, that was the question I had. I spent years really studying and interviewing and looking at this. And I'm going to give you my findings in the shortest way possible. I'm going to say we're reading hundreds and hundreds of books and studying this. Everything about our results in life starts with our belief system. What do we believe? What do we believe? Our belief system is our heart. It's what's inputted into us. And then forevermore, if the input allows for it, we take it out and get results based on the input. Our belief system is installed between age zero and four, usually by very unqualified young people. That's just the fact of the matter. But here's the problem. Rarely do adults ever look hard at their belief system and ask the question, are these beliefs serving me and the people I love? Are these beliefs allowing possibility to happen? And I know this sounds very high level, but let me bring it right down to the streets. I'll tell you a story. I told myself, if I ever have this much money in the bank, I'm going to buy a Porsche. Every stupid young kid wants a Porsche, right? Well, I was one of those. And I thought, man, and, then, and every time I close a house, I throw some money in there, and I go, and look at the receipt, how much do I have in my account? You know, that's, that was my bookkeeping system. They would tell me, oh yeah, that much, good. Well, one day, I went through and I looked at it. There's enough money to buy that Porsche. I could buy a Porsche right now. And I went, done. And I took off. And I drove my old 66 Chevy pickup and my car hard and call all over it and crap. And I drove it right down the University of Porsche Audi. And I parked it on the side of the street. And I walked in the showroom. I looked like I was 12. Actually, I was like 19 and a half, 20. And I walked in the, and I said, wow, how much is that? He told me, oh, I got that much. And I walked around it and walked around it. And the person the sales was looking at me like, what are you doing? Right? And, but, but. I was in my own world, and I'm looking at this, and you know, I check it, I don't have a, you know, a razor knife in my pocket, and I sit in the seats, and, and, and what, what happened next, I couldn't explain it. Now I know exactly what happened. And what happened next is I very slowly, but in an accelerated fashion, started having what we might call an anxiety attack. I've never had one since. I didn't even know what it was. My heart started racing, but it wasn't that I was excited about this Porsche. 
I started looking over my shoulder like I'm watching porn or something, you know? I mean, I felt guilty being there. It was really weird. And I'm going, and all of a sudden it got so bad, I had to like literally run out of the show. I've always wanted to run the sales department. And I ran, I got my truck, I drove three blocks away. I could go to that exact 10 square feet today. And I pulled the truck off, slammed it in park, and I yelled, what is going on? Get a hold of yourself. And I was just, I just, and I, you know, this is before the day when if you talk to yourself, you're on the phone. There was no phone, man. I was just yelling at myself, right? And I go, Greg, you're not leaving here until you figure this out. What is happening? This should be a great day. What is happening? And you know, I just, I'm not leaving until I figure this out. Have you ever tried hard to think about what you're thinking? <laughs> oh, that'll screw you up. What am I thinking? What is going on in my mind? First time I ever really looked in my mind and said, what is your mind thinking? How do you think about what you're thinking? I don't know. But I wouldn't leave until I figured it out. And you know what? As I calmed down, I really thought, what was going on is that I knew if I bought that Porsche, that in probably fairly short order, my dad would see it. And, and, and I knew that when my dad saw it, he would go like this, and I knew exactly the question he would ask. He would go, did you need that? I was raised, you only get what you need. You don't need it. You don't need it. If you can walk one more mile in those shoes, walk one more mile in those shoes. You only get a pair of shoes when you need a pair of shoes. My dad, that flannel shirt, or that, that old shirt that you saw in that picture, he beat for bottom of 17. Still works. Why would you get another one? His cars have like 600,000 miles. It worked. Why would you get another one? And I went, oh my God, Greg, that's the belief system that you were installed. And if you ever want things like this, you won't be able to do it with your belief system. And I went, but I'm an adult. I can say that. Drove away over the process of the next month. I wrote out my belief system. I believe that you should be able to have anything you want if you work honestly and hard for it. Not based on me. You can actually have things you want. And I said it over and over and over again over the process of a month. I visualized cutting out the old belief system, throwing it out the window, and installing a new one. And about a month later, I thought, I'm there. <laughs> I pulled right up to the University of Porsche County, walked right in, and I said, that one. And I brought cash. And I left my piece of shit truck down, and I don't remember picking it up. Eventually I did, but I took off. Awesome. Three months later, not even thinking, just completely oblivious, I am in the Porsche, and I pull up in front of my parents' house, get out, start walking to the front door, and the front door opens, my dad looks right over my shoulder. He goes, what's that? He's a big ticket. I said, oh, what? Oh, my God. Yeah? Is that yours? He said, yeah. When did you get that? I don't know, three months ago. Did you need that? Say that cluster, not another word was said. What an insight for me. People are trying every day to go get what they want with a belief system that doesn't allow for them. Be who they want to be with a belief system that doesn't allow for them. They've never gone in and looked at the hard drive that was installed when you're three in a diaper. If you're lucky, you've got two amazingly educated
educated, wanting parents that are super studying on being great parents. They're financially set. Two of them right there that love each other intimately. And they had you and they went, there's our child. Let's go to work. How many of your parents does that describe? <laughs> does it describe anybody's parents? You see what I'm saying? And yet, most adults are trying to function in this great world with dreams and goals and this and that, and everything goes to hell. Because they're not operating on well thought out belief systems. You see, belief systems ask the next question. They either open or close the door to possibility. Your belief systems either open or close the door to possibility. Period. Said none. So toggle switch. But if you have possibility, if your belief systems allow you to have possibility, then you can create intention. Intention is going after what you want. <coughs> intention is a tongue position and a laser scope. Intention is, I want that. Now, if you're really a philosopher and reader, there's no word in the English language that more books have been written about word intention. The great thinkers have all taken a stab on the word intention. <clears throat> because when you really get into it, the great thinkers say that when you get so laser focused on what you want, somehow, don't explain it, somehow, not only are you going to it, but it's coming to you. Are you freaking kidding me? What? Law of attraction. The secret that is no secret. Guys have been battling it for years, centuries, trying to figure out how does this happen. I have my own philosophy around it. I say that focused intention allows you to see opportunity. The opportunity was always there. You just weren't looking hard enough for it. Waldo is in this picture. Boy, you have to want to find Waldo. Because he's an elusive little creature. With focused intention, opportunity exists. Opportunity, if you go, man, I'm just not seeing any opportunities. I hear that every day of my professional life. And I go, let's just back up one and look at your intention. If we've got to back up again, we're going to look at possibility. If we've got to back up again, we're going to rewire your belief system. Because opportunities everywhere. But your belief system has to open the door and you've got to get focused to look for it. But when we find opportunity, then our toolbox. Our toolbox has a chance to work. Now, do you see how far toolbox is around the list? So do you see how crazy I am to go try to teach toolbox and expect everybody to have results? That's the reality of it. That's why all those great tools that I have never did anything. Well, it wasn't the tools. It was the belief system, the possibility, <coughs> the intention, seeing opportunity. Now, the toolbox is the hard part. I'm a pilot. I have 3,000 hours with somebody sitting next to me, telling me more than I know. I couldn't even begin to tell you how many thousands of hours I've spent teaching what I know, much less learning what I think I have to teach. Toolbox is not casual. It's not just out of water. It's not just whack back. It's done. It's a commitment to be the very, very, very best in your learning, always. But with toolbox, I mean, with the equation, now we get results. Now we get results. Look at this little mom. It's so simple. It's so simple. This model explains extraordinary achievement, and this model explains non-achievement. You see that? When you get results, it automatically upgrades your belief system. It's like a 2.0 upgrade. Because you get results, like, what happens? Your belief system increases. The door of possibility opens wide. 
And what it paints is it paints a picture of how life should be. Right? Now, it's kind of funny when you think about it. I got results as a father at a really, really young age. And evidently, my belief system got upgraded along the way because now I've got a lot of them. A lot of results, right? But on a more serious note, you know, you take something like flying, you know, it's a big, big day. A big, big day when you can when you can get in a plane and there you go by yourself, right? You've 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 learned, you you've grown, you've done it, you, you you've got results, you took off and you landed and you lived. That's the result. But then you go from there and you, you start you start it's what I love about aviation, it's like life. There's no ceiling. There's a little 182 in the space shuttle. But over the years, my own pursuit of aviation, it just, you keep getting bigger, bigger results, more complicated aircraft, because you're growing, right? And in the world of real estate, you remember this crappy little house? That was overwhelming for me when I bought it. Oh my God. I remember a plumber saying, hey, I said, can you, do you think you could move the toilet over here? Is that possible? He looked at me and said, I could mount it upside down on your living room if that's where you want it. <laughs> to me, what was completely impossible to me was like heaven. It's just porcelain pipe. But you start where you are. And you learn and you grow and you stretch. And then the next house, I, I took that one down to the foundation and built it myself from there up. And it was a big accomplishment as a young kid. And then, and then you go, well, I want, a, I want a house in Arizona. Well, let's build it from scratch. Why not? So, you know, that took a couple of years. But, but what, a, what a great feeling and accomplishment. Then you, then you decide at some point, it's like, hey, the, the point is growth. The point is growth. What's the next most impossible thing? So I started this one. This one took eight years and three months with a full crew. 52 panel boxes in this house. It's crazy. Crazy stuff. Right? Stuff that, that who gets to do this kind of stuff? Some dumb B minus kid? Right? But what this describes, what this describes is, is a belief system, a way we can live. Right? This is what the road had in mind. To do things that matter, to live abundantly. Right? How do you measure success? I want you, I want you to just take my definition and consider. Success is growth. Success is growth. I want you to look at this little spiral. This is that model set in a different way. Every year should go upward and outward. Results redefining beliefs and life is getting bigger and more amazing, more abundant. I'm not talking just financial and this. I'm talking about your relationships. I'm talking about everything you care about. Upward and outward and more amazing, right? That's how. Growth is the measure. Growth has always been the measure. And if growth is the measure, do we want growth? Do we want growth? Does everybody in here want growth? Are you sure you want growth? You don't know the answer to this yet. Are you so sure you want growth? What accelerates growth? Motivation. Adversity. Adversity. Greatest teacher in the world. Greatest growth mechanism in the world. Jim Rohn says all significant change that ever happens to you and I has a precursor of difficulty, adversity, and disgust. Think about that. Really? That's what I've got to do to grow? Yeah. You've got to be in pain. You've got to do things that people don't do. You've got to be willing to live a fearless life to grow. If security and safety is the measure, you'll 
will never have an extraordinary life. Well, my dad said this. I'm eight years old. I'll continue with him. I don't have a rifle yet, but I'm with dad at <coughs> 3 o'clock in the morning. We're heading out to where we supposedly we have to be before it gets light. It's about a foot of snow. The ice balls are hitting my face so hard I can't even speak. The wind is howling. It's in the dark. I've got a headlamp. His legs are twice as long as mine, so I'm like running to keep up as we're cutting side hill across this wind tunnel canyon. And right in the middle of that side hill, in the middle of nowhere, he stops, gets down on one knee. Gregor, come in. And I come in, and my little eight-year-old, he says, Gregor, you see anybody? You can barely hear him. No, I don't see anybody. Second day, I don't care where 
this is where, how it happened. Second day, and I don't care whose permission we got. Show me a writing, we got permission, which we did. But, okay. The next year after that meeting, every couple days, I'm going to get a call like this. Hey, great. It's Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. Yeah, what's going on? I haven't talked to you in a couple of years. How's that mean? Da -da -da. Oh, great, 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 great. Oh, my God. He said, listen, they said not to call you. Guess who just left my house? FBI. In that building you bought from me? Oh, man, they asked all kinds of questions about it. I said, hey, what'd you tell me? Awesome. I told the guy there won't sell a house, you should call me. <laughs> Good job, thanks. Every week for a year I get calls like this. They would all say they said not to say anything. But I know that something's going on. Finally I got that call, head prosecutor, Western District, United States for German Assistant. Hey, this is who I am. Can you have a meeting tomorrow at 11 o'clock in my office? You might want to bring this is a Friday, 11 o'clock. I said, what if I've already got a scheduled meeting for him? Change it, he says. Okay. And he says, just, you know, Michael, hey, two agents in your office. Teresa, the mortgage man, and Steve, your escrow person, you're all going to be in that meeting. And I've already told him. And we'll see you tomorrow. I said, can you, you know, can you tell me what this is about? That's what tomorrow is. So we show up at 11. Kurt Hermans says, listen, here it is. We've spent a year, we got this, this what's called a suspicious activity report sent by a bank. We saw a second mortgage reported the same day as the first. Okay, we looked into it. When we just did our initial check on you, Mr. Pino, you've got a lot of real estate. You don't come for money, and we felt obligated to look into it. Well, we've looked into it over the last year. We've spent over a million bucks on an investigation. And here's what we've concluded. I'm just going to cut to the chase. Five times under the sphere of your influence, that's a quote, five times under the sphere of your influence, a second mortgage has been put on a property that had a first position loan on the same day put on it. Now, they were all recorded in second position, but the fact is they were put on the same day as the first. And the loan documents, as I'm sure you know, say there can be no secondary financing on the same day as the first. In fact, five that we found, just so you know, because you're probably going to ask it. All these properties have been sold, so everybody's been cashed out. There is no potential risk. But the fact of the matter, the law has been broken, and we have a deal for you. Everybody has to sign and agree to it, or nobody gets the deal. The escrow, the banker, right? And two agents in my office and me. All have to sign, or nobody gets the deal. And the deal ends at 5 o'clock today. And now it's noon. 5 o'clock. Your house all signed by 5. We're going we're gonna to charge you all on one count of conspiracy to commit bank fraud. One count. And Mr. Penny, you're the leader. That's bad to be a leader in this case because that's bad. They get less than you. Because you've taught him how to do this. You're the broker. You're the professor. You're the influencer. So we're blaming you more. If anybody wants to be tough and pull out, nobody gets the deal and we'll prosecute you all to the full extent of law. We've already spent a million bucks. We've got every agency at our disposal. It's not where you're going to win. You decide. Five o'clock. That was a five-hour period of time I'll never forget in my life. Called my dad. He came down. Called my, my real estate attorney was there. I said, do anything about this? He goes, no. He gets the attorney that would understand this. Bottom line at 445, the only thing to do, according to the attorneys we had, and I believe they made the right decision. We were surrounded with Uzis, and we appreciate it. That's what we signed the <clears throat> Judge William Dwyer was assigned to distribute punishment. Sentence. There's no judge and jury. It's a plea agreement. He just has to sentence you. We all get to act in school in our plea. Because if you don't look like you're sorry, you will get two points off for acceptance of responsibility. 
in what points out because they sentence you by the points. Bottom line, I showed up at a sentencing hearing. Everybody I knew in the known world was there. There was a separate room set up with screens. There were 600 people there. Outraged. The judge announced his resignation after 32 years of being a federal judge because of this. But he carried out the sentence. And when he did, he said, Mr. Pino, I don't know why this is happening to you. Find a way to make this wrong or right. Everybody else just got fined, which was a lot, 10000 each. I got fined $25,000, and the minimum sentence was 13 months in prison. If I was good, I'd be out nine months in a week. You know, I should have known that this could happen. I shouldn't have been surprised. I probably looked at it and go, hey, I can read the paperwork, and if I'm the broker, if I'm the owner, if I'm the professor, I probably could have done a better job saying, it's really got to be the next day. And I should have known, too, because when we were young, when we were young, the great philosopher Geisel told us that at certain times in our life, Our mom read us the great philosopher Geisel when we were three and four and five years old. So why was I surprised? But I was. But why was I? Have you ever felt in the dark? Have you ever felt like you don't know what to do? Yet Geisel, when we were young, he said, you'll come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're dark. A place you could lose both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to go out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And, and if I go in, do I turn left or right? Or right in three quarters? Or maybe not quite? Or go around the back? can sneak in from behind. Simple, it's not. I'm sure you'll find for mind maker up to make up his mind. This was a chapter of confusion. This is where I went into the university of understanding thyself. I had already done hundreds of units. I had an extraordinary life. Lived on a waterfront house and built a porch. I went anywhere I want, I flew my own plane. Hmm, now I'm going back to a different kind of university. Didn't see it coming. But Geisel says this kind of stuff. <coughs> he also says that unslumping yourself is not easy to do. I have an angel, a bride. She was my fiance then. She wrote 760 pieces of mail in nine months a week. Came every Sunday to see me for 40 minutes, 12 hour long trip drive. I learned to fight. I learned a language I didn't know existed. I read it. I studied. But I came out angry, unfortunately. I did get out. I was out on March 18th, first night at home. Wow. What a day. Never forget that. Unbelievable. The same day I got out, I got a bird call. The single best piece of real estate I ever had bought in my life. The call came the day I got out of prison. I bought it. Matter of fact, I borrowed $7 million from a bank. The first 30 days I was out of prison on probation for bank fraud. I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> My probation officer said, who possibly is lending you money? I said, everybody I've ever borrowed from. Matter of fact, they were all there at my sentencing. I knew who to read their letters. And 
she went, oh, I didn't realize I had the famous smile. You'll never hear from me again. I never heard another word for three years from my probation officer, which I appreciate. I got on March 18th, bought the most amazing building in the world. March 21st, I was married to an angel. March 26th, I turned 40 years old. What the hell? I got to tell you, I'm so angry. One of the things that really hit me hard while I was, just before I left, is a whole bunch of my friends were killed on Mount Everest and on Mount Climber, and a whole bunch were killed on Mount Everest in 96, and it was in my blood, and I felt guilty I should have been there. It's when I came out, I felt like a way to work this out might be get the shade dust off my resume and go, go see them on Everest. And so I went to my friends who now own Mount Madness when Scott got killed and Christine and Charlie to go to that, that great adventure company and they had a trip to Everest plan and I made the team and now as a team member, I'm going for my own reasons. <clears throat> got to work some things out. But part of what I had to do was go climb to 20,000 feet in the year of the permit in the hall. After everybody got killed in 96, they put the rules in, you got to be a climber, you can't be a short roper, you, you got to, you got to be familiar with this stuff. And so, okay, you've got to check it off the list. A few 20,000 feet or more in the year of the permit in the hall. One of the climbers on that team and I teamed up and said, okay, let's, let's just go to South America and, and we'll, there's all kinds of peaks in the Andes that are over 20,000, not all kinds, but there's one. And uh, so we flew into La Paz and we were there to climb the And um, so we show up in La Paz and I'm there for my own reasons and we, we're going to climb the High altitude climbing, you have to acclimate, so you're up and down, you're up and down, you're up and down. Finally, when you get to a high camp, you go, right? And so we choose our day to get to the high camp, and we get up to 18,000 feet. And we set up, and as we're getting to 18,000 feet, the snow is coming in sideways, and we sat in a whiteout for three days while it snowed about three feet deep. We couldn't see three feet And, you know, you can't wait at 18,000 feet too long. You, know, you, may, you may have to come down, but, but right as the decision time came, the sky cleared, the barometer held steady, and we said, now or never, let's do it. Well, that's great, but the problem is, is that all this very cold snow now is, is covering all the crevasses, and there's a whole bunch of crevasses on the way up. So we knew there was additional risk because we couldn't see them because of the new snow that created snow bridges over the crevasses. We set out. We switch who's in front. If you're in front, plunging, 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 stepping, stepping, plunging, plunging. You don't put weight on anything until you know it's going to hold. And you keep going. And we're back and forth and back and forth. And we're at about 21,000 feet. The summit's at 23. And he is in front of me. And he's come around the corner this way. It's about 55 degrees slope this way. He's around the corner, cutting a side hill, beginning a ridge to go to the summit. We have 100 feet of rope out between us. And so I'm now in his footsteps at this stage, staying right in his footsteps because they're tested, right? Rope going down the hill, race harness, 100 feet of rope out. I'm moving along. And all of a sudden, the rope goes from the slack down the hill and dragging. And I pulled from my waist to my face. I'm going this way now on my face, but I'm also going this way because it's so steep. And all it's like being towed by a car. Of course, I knew intuitively what happened. He went through a snow bridge in a crevasse. He's going down, which is pulling me this way. This way. You get the idea? We're trained for this, but here we go, right? 
and I start plunging, 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 plunging with my axe. And there's so much snow to get into the ice, it's really tough. And so I'm plunging, plunging, and I'm moving faster and faster. And you know, you've got 100 feet, you're going, and then, oh man, I spin around, and I'm plunging, and I got like this little bite of ice, this little squeak, and I went, and it brought all the weight onto my arm like this, and I'm like, boom, like this, and then it broke, because, you know, but it slowed me down enough to where the next plunge, I really threw it in there, and I could tell it was a three or four tooth bite, you know, where, the, where your axe goes in it, and boom, it comes up on the wrist, and then you kick your toe pieces in, and you, you hike up on top of your axe. You get on top of your axe, you put it right on your chest, you throw your arm over, you spread out your legs, and now that is the arrest position for your buddy who's down. I look under my arm, I look back, and the rope is disappearing 15 feet behind me, just into the snow. Just two. And of course, he's in a crevasse under there. And he's on the line. I can feel his weight like a fish on the line, and it's dangling, and it's pulling. And we're at high altitude, and we don't have oxygen. And immediately, your lactic acid starts going crazy, and you're like drowning because you can't breathe, and you're shaking, and then you start throwing up. And it's a crazy scene, right? And I know what he's trained to do, and he's working on it. He has got to get the weight off me. So in a dark crevasse, he's got to find one of the outside walls of the crevasse. So he starts swinging like this, trying to get to an outside wall where he could kick in, axe our in, and get the weight off of me up above, right? And he's swinging, and I'm going, come on, find the wall. I can feel it. If the rope is hitting my inner legs back and forth like this, and I'm like, come on, find the wall, find the wall. And then the rope came back to a center position. The swinging stopped, and all his weight was still on. And I have to tell you that that's when that's when it was scary. That's when it hit. Oh, no. Because you know your partner's alive. You know, it's that simple. Everything got real still. My mind started. I started to feel better. Your training says that means you're going into shock. So then you bite through your blood to, to, to create pain so that you come out of shock. But still, I, I was intellectually far away. Really far away. And as I'm struggling, it's almost like it was the sound that was out there. So sort of like it, it, it echoed inside of my mind. It was crystal. The message that was so crystal clear isn't my message, it's all of our message. I was thinking in metaphors about all the people I've talked to, all the students I've had. And I'm literally having this intellectual discussion while gasping for air and, and, and exploding. It was like the still and the craziness. It occurred to me that the reason I was giving everything I had and on wasn't just about my partner. I was hanging on to it. And it was real clear. If you let go, you're done. You let go, you fall backwards, you go right down that hole, and you'll never see the two of you again, and it's over. It was so crystal clear. It's never been a more clear moment in my life. But I thought, this isn't just about you, Greg. This is about everybody you've ever talked to. I'm hanging on for what I haven't done yet. I'm hanging on for those dreams, those relationships, those moments, those connections that haven't yet come to my life. I'm hanging on for my goals, my dreams, my kids that I want to see grow up. My youngest daughter at that time was one, and her name is Everest. I'm hanging on for 
I'm sitting there messing myself, throwing up, shaking, not even knowing what's happening. And yet my mind was calm and crystal clear. It's this simple break. Hang on and you live. Let go. Die. And yet that's you and me every single day. Everywhere I go, I see people who have let go because they're afraid. They let go of what somebody might say. They let go because their heart learning doesn't allow for them to think possibility. They've given up. Their life is one big concession. Most men lead lives of quiet desperation, says Henry David Thoreau. They've let go. Relationships. Why the hell are you together? Companies that just are boring and crappy and they hate going to work every day. Let go. Go out there in the freeway and look in the faces of people in the morning. They've let go. Everywhere I go, I see people who've let go. The walking dead. Hang on. Hang on. And you live. I wake up without that every day. I've lived a very dangerous life. I advocate you doing the same. Caring. Giving a damn. Signing your name to everything you do. Your best effort. Your best effort. Your very, very best. Nothing short. Ever. Mediocrity is the enemy. We are so blessed to live where we live. We're so blessed as adults to choose how we think, what we want to be. We get to choose our belief system. We get to choose the course of our intention. We get to choose it, and therefore we get to choose our opportunities, and we decide whether we're going to know our stuff or not. Bullshitting your way through life is just crap. Know your stuff. Know your stuff. Know it better than anyone else. And then you get results. You can be proud of it. Those results upgrade your belief system, and your life is upward and upward and upward and upward. It's amazing, which is not to say dangerous. It's beautifully, wonderfully dangerous. I told you when we started that um, I had really one objective. Right? I think it's fair to ask. Did I have So tonight, before you check in, you're going to tell me, if this was a waste of your time, you just text me WT. I will make it right. There is nothing more unforgivable than taking people's time and wasting it. Kipling says it's our life. Fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds of distance run. Nothing short. If I've wasted your time, oh boy. Expect that I will overkill and handle it. But if by chance I came with I would need to do anything that happened when you're disturbed and yet somehow feel intolerant, I want you to tell me that. And then I want you Being disturbed is the best day of your life if it needs to change. Wheels up tomorrow morning, Arizona tomorrow night. Thanks for giving me.